Okay, it says it's recording. I think we're good. So my name is Valerie Burke. This is my first time with Harmony Hill and webinars, both. And I'm just absolutely thrilled to be here and so much appreciate the opportunity to present this information. I am a nurse by trade and uh, formerly a nurse practitioner. Uh, for the past several years, I have been not working as a nurse practitioner, but working as a writer um, for Mercola.com. And some of you are probably familiar with that. It's a huge um, health website. Dr. Mercola is a, a physician who has basically devoted his whole practice for many years to putting out um, kind of non-traditional health information. And uh, I've been writing for his newsletter. So I, I just have to clarify, though, this presentation is my own. It may reflect a lot of his principles, but it also is my own thing, so I can't say that this is a Mercola presentation. So I just wanted to be clear about that. I have been a nurse for more than 25 years. Uh, just a little bit about how I got from nursing to paleo and nutrition. I um, got my psychiatric mental health nursing degree in 96, and I worked for a number of years doing therapy with children and various things. And I, I just gravitated over to the more uh, holistic side of medicine, it was a gradual progression over the past 10, 15 years. Um, I've also battled my own chronic health problems since I was a kid. Probably age four or five they started. And so I, that has been a major driving force in my life, um, first toward Western medicine and then toward nutrition and all of the things that Western medicine does not do well, which is managing chronic conditions. But the blessing in that is that I have learned a tremendous amount along the way, and that led me to wanting to give this information out to others who are also struggling. And, you know, for me, it's a daily uh, process of, of managing symptoms and optimizing how I feel, and nutrition and lifestyle is just really the most important factor. So that's a little bit about me. The Paleo Plus presentation, actually, I've been... I've given this this class several times over the past few years, and I kept getting feedback, well, we want more information about this. Where can we get more information? So I decided to write a book. And last year, in September, I published it, which is called Is the Tale Right for You? So for more information, you can always look at that. It's available both in uh, digital format for Kindle and in paperback. So anyway, let's go ahead and enough about me. Let's get on with the presentation. So what we're going to do, um, this is not really a presentation about the paleo diet for people who have already decided to do it. This is more looking at it for those of you who are undecided, want to know more about it, why to do it, and how it might help you with your health. And so it's not the kind of thing where you have to do all or nothing. Um, there's many aspects of it, many principles that could help you. And, you know, it's a, I really believe in kindness to yourself, you know, not putting pressure on ourselves to make major changes all at once. So even if you just took a principle and implemented it, um, it's just important to know why, you know, what is going to be the benefit in that, and making little changes is great. Um, so we're going to be looking at a lot of different principles that come from the paleo diet and other, other aspects. Um, so anyway, let's get going. There's my little animation there. So basically, our standard American diet is not doing very good things for us. As probably if you're here, you already know that. We're digging our graves with our forks, so to speak. Standard American diet is just leading us to be sick, fat, depressed, tired, and out of shape. Most of it, you know, for typical Americans, is very heavy in sugar and processed foods with a lot of refined carbohydrates and grains. And unfortunately, the guidelines we're getting from the food industry and from government are quite upside down. Um, they're driven largely nowadays by... Uh, corporate interests, and not so much by an interest in keeping us healthy. So if you want to make the drug companies richer, follow the government's food pyramid. But if you want to be healthy, then you have to do a little bit of investigating on your own. 
I have a lot of these little uh, comical things inserted in here because I didn't want it to be dry and boring. <laughs> There's a lot of information out there and it can be really overwhelming and really confusing. So the key is to look back at our roots and see how we evolved in terms of food and how we evolved in terms of the nutrients that we took in and what we're doing now that's different than what we were doing millions, thousands and millions of years ago. And basically, we're not eating in accordance with our genes. So if you look back at the Paleolithic period, this was 2.6 million years ago to about 10,000 years ago, 10 to 12,000. Well, what does it mean eating in accordance with our genes? Well, our genes are shaped by the environment that our ancestors um, lived in through natural selection. And those who could, could hunt down their food and avoid becoming someone else's dinner survived. And those who couldn't do that didn't. So our metabolism evolved around this diet and this lifestyle. And the standard American diet is just out of step with, with our genes, and it manifests itself in the many diseases that we see today. The statistics here are pretty disturbing. As of 2011, 75% of us and nearly a third of children in this country are obese or overweight. 25% of us have some form of diabetes or prediabetes. And the journal The Lancet reported that nearly every country faces alarming obesity rates now. In fact, globally, there's been an 82% increase in obesity over the past uh, two decades. For example, Middle Eastern countries are more obese than ever. They've seen a 100% increase since 1990. And this is all a result of the Western lifestyle being adapted by people all over the world. According to a recent study, nearly 1 billion people worldwide are now obese or overweight. And one in five Americans now dies from obesity. And these statistics include deaths from type 2 diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, liver disease, cancer, depression, dementia. And the common thread in all of these is metabolic dysfunction, which comes from our diet and our lifestyle. But the good news is obesity is almost 100% preventable through diet and lifestyle. And a recent uh, study, this was really fascinating. There have been a couple of studies recently. Mothers as well as fathers can actually pass on obesity tendencies to their unborn children, according to the studies that I've been looking at. So there's actually such a thing as fat sperm, sperm that are carrying these uh, lifestyle choices and tendencies onto the unborn babies. We thought it was just moms, but it was actually moms and dads. So our ancestors were hunter-gatherers. So what does this mean? Well, they ate primarily wild meat and game, wild plants, fish, roots, nuts and seeds, and occasionally fruits. Fruits were seasonal. So carbohydrates were fairly rare. Most of their foods were protein, fats, and fiber. What they didn't eat was refined sugar, processed food, pasta and pizza, Captain Crunch, Twinkies, Hungry Caveman dinners, dairy products, bread and cereal grains. So the, the big question I, I'm asked all the time is how much meat did they eat? And it's not really an easy question to answer because we don't really know. Um, there's a lot of theories out there. The availability of meat and other foods really varied a lot by season and by habitat, by geographic region. They did a lot of small animal foraging. And our ancestors increased their meat consumption as their hunting, and, uh, hunting skills and tools progressed. Meat intake increased as Paleolithic man acquired the use of fire. So uh, tools progressed over time, fire came into it, and this was all leading to genetic adaptation. And then his brain size increased along with his increased protein as soon as he was able to cook his food. Your brain requires nine times as much energy as any other organ of your body. 
this this was really a, a, a aha moment for me because I do so much writing, and uh, I get more tired and more hungry when I'm writing than I do if I'm out walking briskly, you know, and, and this really makes a lot of sense to me. And according to some reports, you know, and so and it back to the question about how much meat did they eat, um, it seemed like a fairly common estimate that about two-thirds of his diet was from animals and fish. And this included, um, you know, little land dwellers like rodents and reptiles and turtles and snakes and insects and things like that. And then about a third from wild plants with variations by region and season. <laughs> I like that one. So we were merrily going about our hunting and gathering for a couple million years until something happened 10,000 years ago. And this changed our eating habits forever. Can you guess what that was? Yes, agriculture. And as wonderful as agriculture was, it had its disadvantages um, in addition to its advantages. It brought grains about a thousand years ago, and then dairy not too long after that, and then of course wine and beer about 6,000 years ago. But then things kind of went downhill after that. We, we got refined sugar. Well, first we got just sugar and then refined sugar and vegetable oils, hydrogenated oils, which are, are not good, and then all of the processed foods, Oreos, and, and high fructose corn syrup now is in, you know, the vast majority of all processed foods that are on the shelf. So being the seed of a grass, uh, Paleolithic man didn't eat very many grains, uh, so that was something that changed with the advent of agriculture. and they. They were just too dang hard to eat. You know, they were hard and, and you couldn't really eat them without grinding them or soaking them or, you know, somehow processing them into a, an edible form. And so grains were a major change with agriculture. And he had been eating mostly meat and vegetables and roots. Our digestive tracts are not accustomed to these foods. In fact, our bodies just don't metabolize them properly. We are genetically programmed to store carbs. And this, you can see how this happened because they were rare. They were not so available then as they are now. So for our hunter-gatherer ancestors, carbs served the purpose of quick energy. We evolved these metabolic, metabolic programs to turn carbs into fat. And that made energy available for later when we needed it for survival. So if you were gonna commit one formula to, to memory from this little class, it should be this, carbohydrates equal fat. But today the problem is we don't have any mammoths that we're outrunning, but we have carbohydrates everywhere around us. So these fat stores never get depleted and they just get bigger and bigger and bigger, as do our belt loops. Probably they weren't as obsessed then as we are now with the number of calories in our diet. Okay, so the, the next thing we really need to talk about to understand why our metabolisms are, are messed up right now is what does insulin do? What is the role of insulin, this hormone that we have that um, can become so dysfunctional and is so commonly dysfunctional today? Well, insulin is the hormone that gets sugar into your cells in the form of glycogen. That's a short-term storage molecule. So it can be used for energy. Glycogen is the stored form of sugar in your cells. So it protects your cells from becoming overloaded with sugar. Someone described this to me as pouring pancake syrup on your laptop. Not a good thing. Your cells can only store a small amount of sugar at a time. Once they're full, the remainder gets converted to fat for long-term storage. And then what can happen is you can get something called insulin resistance. So the more sugar you have in your system, the more insulin you need. 
When your blood sugar is chronically elevated, your body compensates by reducing insulin sensitivity. And this is called insulin resistance. And it's the first step in a cascade of changes biologically that have been dubbed metabolic syndrome. And, and that's the path that you go down toward type 2 diabetes. So this further prompts your body to store every carbohydrate it's fat. Insulin also regulates sodium, magnesium, and calcium. It stimulates your sympathetic nervous system. So this is your fight or flight or freeze response. And it can cause cell proliferation, and, and this is um, involved in certain forms of cancer. Cancer feeds off sugar. Not only that, when you're insulin resistant, your body loses its ability to burn fat for energy. And so your fat burning engine is literally switched off. So metabolic syndrome is something that uh, is, is epidemic proportions in the West and in the United States. So as we talked about, it's marked by insulin resistance, obesity, accumulation of fat, especially around the midsection, high blood pressure, high blood sugar, and elevated LDL and triglycerides. So sugar, especially fructose, is almost instantly converted into fat by your liver. And the thing is that there is no amount of exercise that can compensate for this metabolic damage once it gets going until you correct your diet. How many people do you know who have, whoops, didn't mean to do that, <laughs> getting ahead of myself. But do you, we, I think we all know these people who spend so much time and energy going to the gym, but they've not made any significant changes to their diet. You know, they're still doing the uh, triple, you know, chocolate mocha on the way to the gym thinking, well, I'll just burn it off, and it doesn't work because you're not fixing the underlying um, fat-burning engine that's broken. <laughs> As a nurse, I, I, I would do so many things differently now. I wish I could take back a lot of the advice I gave for many years, but I guess the important part is you live and you learn and you, you start where you, you are. Okay, well, let's um, I want to just check in and see if anybody has any questions at this point. So I guess I have to look at my little uh, chat window here. I don't see any there. Bell. Bell. Was I muted? Okay, now it seems like it'll let me ask you a question. Oh, good. <laughs> I thought maybe I muted myself by accident. I hope not. I'm so sorry. Um, I did have a question. <clears throat> the, you know, when you're talking about metabolic syndrome, et cetera, like, you know, I tend to, you know, be a chronic carbohydrate consumer, and uh -huh. but my blood sugar isn't that high. Can it sometimes be like as a precursor to this metabolic syndrome show as being low because your body's like making too much insulin before it, the whole thing actually breaks? Should I be worried about that? Um, you know what I mean? Well, metabolic syndrome is more than just blood sugar, so that's just one of the factors. Um, basically, it's it's more you have to look at, you know, your uric acid level, your insulin level, your blood sugar, your weight, uh, your you know your blood pressure. It's kind of like looking at all of those things because metabolic syndrome is a syndrome, meaning many 
symptoms, and the body okay. can compensate. You know, you can be compensating. Maybe your body's pretty good at keeping that blood sugar okay, but maybe your insulin level is high. Um, you know, so it's that gotcha. Because, I mean, it's usually, like, in the in the lower 90s, which it makes mm-hmm. me always think, oh, okay, I'm doing all right. But sometimes I wonder if that's just, like, you know, the, like, calm before the storm. <laughs> now, 90s is, is technically, according to, you know, the basic standards, is okay, but actually you really want it to be lower than that. Oh. You want it to be down in the 70s or 80s optimally. So even though that's not technically high, it's a little. It, it does reflect a little bit of an elevation for a fasting. Oh, okay. now, we want to be at the lower end. We, we don't want to be at the upper end of normal. Gotcha. Well, that's good to know because I've always thought, oh, if you get near 100, you're perfect, and you only have to worry about it if you're over 100. Yeah, kind it's a whole thing. spectrum. Yeah, it's a whole spectrum. Yeah. So if you were to okay. actually be able to get those carbohydrate cravings under control for a couple weeks and retest them, mm-hmm. I bet you it would be quite a bit lower. Oh, no, I have no doubt. I have no doubt. Yeah. All righty. Well, thank you so much for answering that question. It looks like there's somebody else, uh, Sandra, who's wanting to ask you a question as well. So I'll let you get See, on I'm to not her. Seeing, okay, I'm not seeing the hand. Where where am I? Um, where does the hand come up? Uh, well, if you look at the attendees list um, in the window, you'll see Karen Gottlieb has raised your hand and that Sandra McCall has asked a question. Okay. Oh, there's the hand. <laughs> okay. All right. So I'm muting me now. Thank you so much, Val. You bet. And I'm okay. Raise hand. Okay. Allow. Uh. <laughs> okay. I'm having a hard time uh, trying to unmute you. Oh, there we go. Okay, I guess I'm going to need some help, Vic. I can't seem to, there's no place to unmute Karen. Vic, are you there? I am here. Sorry, I was trying to get on here and I can't I'm clicking on the hand but nothing's happening well my goodness <laughs> it's not just me well apparently not uh, okay. you should you should be able to have an unmute button in your panel next to her I'm not sure why that's mm-hmm. not showing up for you right now it's Maybe what we could do is invite Sandra and Karen to type their questions into the chat box, and then okay. we can go ahead and answer them there. Or you can, rather. I'm sorry, not me. So, okay, Karen sure. and Sandra, if you could do that, that would be great. Thank you so much. And, I, and while they're doing that, I have a question from Christine. Um, she is asking me, how is insulin tested? Is it different than the glucose test? Yes, it is a different test. Um, it's easy to measure. It's a blood test, just like glucose. Doctors don't routinely um, do it, but you can ask for it. And uh, off the top of my head, I there's actually a list of about six recommended um, blood tests, and it's in one of Dr. Mercola's articles, and I'd be happy to send you that information if uh, if you'd like. And then Sandra is asking, does the body treat all sugar the same? Whoops. I was reading the question and it disappeared. Uh, okay, does the body treat all sugar the same? For example, table sugar versus honey. Um, no, it doesn't. And although you will hear to the contrary that it does, it really doesn't. The, the sugar biochemists have um, shown this unequivocally. Table sugar... Uh, fructose especially is treated differently on the body than glucose, and we're going to get into that a little bit after after the Q&A, so I'll explain a little bit about that. But the main differences are glucose versus fructose, and all the different sweeteners have different proportions of those sugars in them, 
and other sugars, but those two act very differently. Okay, and a question from Karen. Uh, she says she typed her question in the Q and A box. Da, 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 da. Um, yes, I do have a handout and just one one single page, and I would be happy to. Well, actually, that's already on the Harmony Hill site. Um, okay, and and you'll be able to view this. Um, webinar on YouTube so you can go back and see all the slides uh, after it's posted on there. And I'm not sure uh, when that will be, but we can ask Vic that. Okay. Hi, Karen. I think I just unmuted you. Hi. Did you? Hi. Oh, good. Okay. What, what happened was something flashed on my screen and it gave oh. me an ID number. So I just called back in and uh, oh. okay, and, and entered my ID number, and now apparently it's working. Okay. Well, I don't yeah. know if I answered your question there a moment ago. Um, sorry, but I was trying to call back in. And I didn't oh, hear. okay. Well, your question about uh, will the handouts be available? Um, I don't have. I have oh, one handout and. And so that will be available on the Harmony Hill website. But as far as the slides go, you can go back and view those after it's posted to the website. Right, that's and, and right. Yeah, so it will be posted to the website, and I can go back. Yeah, and them. yeah, all the I slides. The first couple. Okay. 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 Thanks. Great. Thanks. You bet. Okay. What is the best sweetener to use? Uh, is asked by Yolanda. Well, there's there's a lot of different ones. Um, I'll be talking, I'm going into the whole section about sugars here momentarily, so that'll probably help clarify. But if you're looking for a sweetener that is absolutely not going to have any impact on your, negative impact on your body, stevia is my favorite. It's an herb and it has no, you know, it doesn't stimulate insulin, it doesn't do anything bad, and um, so that's my favorite. But then... As far as, as other, you know, sugar-based sweeteners, honey is probably my favorite because it's unprocessed. As long as it's unprocessed, not heated, you know, organic, local preferably. But you have to watch how much you're eating of it, and we're going to get into the whole bit about fructose because honey does have fructose in it. Same Agave syrup has fructose in it. A lot of them do, and you have to watch your total because you're going to get into problems with your insulin uh, if you have too much, you know, total sugars. Okay. Um, let's see. Karen says she's having trouble getting sound on her computer now that she is muted. Um, hi, Karen. I unmuted you. Okay, yeah. All of a sudden, my picture and sound is gone. Let's see. Return. Oh. Cool. Wait a minute. Well, shoot. Now I'm back on, is this paleo diet right for you? Go ahead with what you're doing. I'll, I'll just play around. Okay. I want to All right. Well, we'll just move on here. Okay. All right. To get back to the right screen. Okay, so we're we're now into the sugar section, as I was alluding to. Um, death by sugar. This kind of looks like a global warming chart, but it's more more of an expanding waistline chart. Um, this shows sugar consumption over the past almost hundred years. On this horizontal axis, this is years, and then on the vertical axis is sugar consumption in pounds per year per person. And as you can see, since 1820, we have gone straight up up in our sugar consumption, which is really a bad thing for a food that we didn't even evolve a way to process, at least at these quantities, and one that really has very little nutritional value at all. So that's just a good illustration of uh, what a radical change we've had. 
The average American consumes two tons of sugar in his or her lifetime. So sugar, especially fructose, is the most dangerous food on the planet when it comes to our health. It promotes cortisol, uh, or adrenaline release, which is the stress home hormone, and this is what causes you to feel like fight or flight or freeze, keeps us hyped up. It is not good for the immune system. It impairs it. Um, bacteria, fungi, and viruses all thrive in a sugar-rich environment. It in inhibits the hormone leptin, which is important for controlling appetite. It, uh, leptin is what signals you to stop eating when you've had enough. So we want that operating. Drives insulin resistance, which we talked about already. Promotes fat storage and weight gain. Promotes oxidative stress and premature aging. Oxidative stress is, is what damages your cells and, and drives the aging process forward, which leads, and it also leads to a lot of uh, disease, chronic disease. Fuels cancer cell growth. Disrupts muscle building and produces AGEs. What are AGEs? Uh, advanced glycogen end products. This is a group of compounds that form when sugar reacts with amino acids, which is called glycation. And it's one of the major mechanisms for disease and aging. So fructose is particularly bad at promoting AGEs and speeding up cellular aging. And so when I talk about fructose, I'm not talking about a piece of fruit or two a day. We're talking about things like high fructose corn syrup, which are massive, concentrated hits on the liver of this unnatural form of fructose. You still have to watch, you know, your overall fructose from fruit and from, you know, honey and things like that. But I'm talking mostly about the commercial stuff. Cravings for sugar are not unlike heroin addiction. So eating sugar triggers the prediction of your brain's natural opioids, which are a key factor in addiction. And sugar causes inflammation. In fact, it's probably the most significant factor underlying most chronic disease because inflammation, you know, when you have, your whole body has this chronic low-level inflammation, this is the uh, genesis of many kinds of health problems that we see today. So sugar metabolism increases uric acid. And this uh, causes high blood pressure, drives the blood pressure up. And chronically elevated blood pressure can damage your kidneys, as well as creating inflammation throughout your body. That inflammation, when it affects your blood vessels, which it will, cardiovascular disease can happen. And so that sets you up for a risk of heart attacks and strokes and things like that. Inflammation in the gut can result in leaky gut syndrome. And this is, you've probably heard of that. It's a, an imbalance in your gut flora, which basically destroys your immune system, which is, you know, 90% of your immune system begins in your gastrointestinal tract. And so when you have leaky gut, allergies and chronic systemic inflammation and all sorts of adverse health things can happen, including some forms of cancer. We'll be talking a little bit more about leaky gut later, but um, basically what it is is the lining of your GI tract becomes inflamed and damaged, and the little cilia, the little hair-like things that line it, um, break down. And so what happens is food particles and chemicals and things that shouldn't go into your bloodstream seep through the wall of your GI tract into your bloodstream. And this can set you up for allergies, uh, inflammation, autoimmune problems, uh, all kinds of things. So it doesn't take a whole lot of sugar to poison your body. How much fructose is too much? Well, about 25 grams a day. Most people eat 70 grams a day, average. Unfortunately, our teenagers eat a lot more than that. But a good goal is to limit your overall fructose uh, to uh, 25 grams. Now, I am, I thought my fructose chart was next, but I see it isn't, but we'll get back to that. Basically, I have a chart that shows the amount of fructose in all fruits, or not all fruits, but a lot of fruits, and dried fruits, so you can kind of see 
um, and compare them. I thought that was next, but I see it isn't. So we'll come back to that in a moment. Okay. So switching from sugar to fat. This is big fat lie number one. Fat makes you fat. This is one of the biggest nutritional myths in the history of our country. If, you, if I do nothing else in this presentation, remember that fat doesn't make you fat. Well, this got started back in 1953 when a guy named Ansel Keys did a, did a study, a very poor study, and um, drew an erroneous conclusion that fat caused heart disease. But the problem was he didn't control for sugar, and sugar was the real culprit. But this spread like wildfire, and saturated fat was blamed for all ills. So basically, the whole fast food industry came out of this. Fat was removed from processed foods, and, well, then the foods tasted like crap. So they had to add something back in to make them palatable. So they dumped in a bunch of sugar and salt and chemicals. Sugar is the real culprit behind the escalating rates of diabetes and obesity and heart disease and other serious health problems, not fat. Unfortunately, however, low-fat, high-carb diets are still recommended by the AMA and the American Dietetic Association, which now goes by a different name that escapes me, and most cardiologists, unless you're lucky enough to have a, a holistic cardiologist. And there is one up in uh, Seattle area. So pretty soon we won't fit through our front door thanks to all this great medical advice. Like our little friend, the mouse. I'm just saying. <laughs> okay. More about high fructose corn syrup, our nemesis. So here is a graph that will kind of show you how much of that we've been eating. So we go from on the horizontal axis 1976 to 2000, and on the vertical axis is pounds of, of uh, high fructose corn syrup, and you can see we've gone straight up, and on this, axis over here, we can see our obesity rates, which have climbed accordingly. So fructose in these concentrated forms is really hard on the liver. In fact, 100% um, of it has to be broken down by your liver. And this is really different than glucose, for example, which can be broken down by every cell in your body, including in your brain. So when you're eating, you're drinking a soda, and you're drinking this concentrated form of fructose, the whole burden of it goes straight to your liver. And in fact, the byproducts are similar to alcohol. One of them is uric acid. So it's like alcohol without the buzz. So if we go back to our hunter-gatherer friends, they were not getting this amount of sugar in any form. They only really knew sugar as fructose and fruit, and honey, you know, when they would run across a, a beehive. It was a seasonal treat, as was honey. But today, four of the five top calorie sources are carbohydrates. And this is exactly the opposite of how they ate. Sugar's in everything. You know, if you look at your box of cereal, bread, crackers, even things that really you don't think of as sweet, it's in there. Fructose is the number one source of calories in the Western diet. And in fact, cirrhosis of the liver now is being thought to possibly be, um, be from obesity more than it is from alcohol. So this is because of the impact fructose has on your liver. Ah, there's my fructose chart. It somehow got it migrated. I think I have gremlins in my PowerPoint. So to answer this question on how much fructose is too much, it's helpful to be able to see how much you're getting from fruit. And so in this chart, you know, it starts on this left side with the low 
low sugar fruits, you know, lemons and limes and cranberries. Berries in general are, are pretty good. And then you get into um, some of the higher things like honeydew and banana. You're, you're up here into six to seven grams per, per piece of fruit. But take a look at the dried fruits here. You know, looking at seven to 23 grams in these dried fruits. <laughs> Vic and I were talking the other day about our favorite, which is dates. One medium medjool date is 7.7 .7 grams of fructose. So two dates and you're at your, you know, you're at almost 15 grams. So even though the goal is 25 grams a day, what I like to tell people is if you have metabolic issues, insulin issues, weight issues, whatever, you might want to shoot for, <laughs> Vic says, no, say it ain't so. <laughs> I agree. I have them in my pantry. But you might want to shoot for actually 15 grams a day from fruit because if you're eating any processed foods at all, you're going to be getting another 5 to 10. You just can't avoid it. But if you've got a pretty clean diet and you don't do processed foods, then, you know, most of your fructose is going to come from fruit. So this is the, this is the sheet that I do have a handout for, for those of you who want to uh, download it. Okie dokie. So this just kind of illustrates, it's kind of a handy pie chart because you can really see how much our diet has changed. Um, the colored wedges show what our ancestors ate. So you got your meat and eggs and your fish and your nuts, seeds and legumes and, and your fruit. And then the white wedges came after the onset of agriculture. So you got your dairy and your grains and your refined vegetable oils and your refined sugars. As you can see, about 75 of our modern diet is refined foods, and our ancestors ate none of those. Not only are they high in calorie and high in energy, but they're very low in nutrition compared to the ancestral diet. Okay, that brings us to big fat line number two. Saturated fat, saturated fat is bad. Saturated fats from properly raised animals are extremely health-promoting and excellent sources of energy for the human body. This may take some mental reprogramming. I know it did for me because we've done, had it drilled into us for many years that saturated fats are, are bad for us. So what does properly raised mean? Well, this would be fats from animals who have been raised on pasture. Um, these are extremely healthy fats for we humans, uh, humanely treated and humanely killed, free of antibiotics and hormones, sustainably raised, animals that are not confined to small spaces like you know thousands of them crammed into a warehouse, organic, local, and biodynamically raised if possible. So most of the meats in the grocery store and the dairy does not come from animals like this. They come from CAFOs, confined animal feeding operations also known as factory farms. Bottom line is, fat doesn't make you fat. Excess sugar makes you fat. Remember, uh, carbohydrates equal fat. That was your formula to remember. So take a guess. What percentage of your food should consist of fat? Yep. Believe it or not, 50 to 75 percent, and that's, um, you know, that's quite a bit. Now, that doesn't mean by volume. That means by caloric intake, you know, so, you know, and a little bit of fat goes a long way, so it might not be as much as you initially think about. It's not like your whole plate's full of fat. But, so how do we accomplish this? Well, a good way to do it is with a paleo diet because it tends to have a pretty good ratio of, of the macronutrients, the carbohydrates to protein to fat. But we have to basically turn our fat burning engines back on by returning to how we used to eat. So the paleo diet was probably made most popular by Lauren Cordain. It's been around for a lot of years. It's not new, um, but Lauren Cordain is the one that wrote the book called Paleo Diet which is what most people are familiar with. But it's been around for about 40 years. It's trending upward lately. 
it's not a diet at all. In fact, I don't even like calling it the paleo diet because it's really more of a lifestyle. It's not something that you're going to implement for a month or six months and go back to the old way of eating. The basic premise is that 99% of our genetic code has not changed over the past 10,000 years, but our environment and the foods that we eat have changed drastically. And the other part of it is that Paleo Man was engaged in almost constant physical activity. And so he was a fat-burning machine. He blew through that glycogen, you know, all, all day long. And so he didn't have this problem that we have of our fat-burning engines becoming sluggish because they can't remember how to operate. So why is the Paleo Diet stood the test of time? Because it's nutritionally sound and people feel better on it. Okay, so the advantages of the paleo diet. The foods are all nutritionally dense. There's a good macronutrient balance, meaning carbohydrates to fat to protein. Better trace nutrients because you're eating an increased variety of food. Your insulin response is better, and therefore, if you need to lose weight, that happens pretty much automatically. If you need to gain weight, that happens automatically as well got a low glycemic load. It's high in fiber if you eat enough vegetables. It's not about all meat, as some people, I think, believe. It gives you good electrolyte balance because it's higher in potassium, lower in sodium. It's got good acid alkaline balance. Again, you've got to have those vegetables. Those are really important. Hypoallergenic, a really good fatty acid profile, and the food is so good. And the downside? Well, here's the deal. You have to come back next week to find out because I'm going to address that. There are some downsides, but it's not, it's not a deal breaker. I'm just going to basically tell you how to tweak things a little bit so that, they, so that they will work best for you. How's that for a teaser? Okay, are there any scientific studies? There are a few. There's not a lot. Um, there are four that are worth mentioning, um, and a few studies that have been done have been small, but they've had excellent results. So I'll just briefly mention these four. Uh, in 2007, Lindelberg put 29 people with type 2 diabetes or heart disease on the paleo diet, and they all showed improvement in their blood sugar and leptin after 12 weeks. And then in 2008, Osterdahl had a 14, 14 subjects that he put on paleo for three weeks. Every one of them lost weight, reduced their waist size, had better blood pressure, and better blood clotting profiles. And then in 2009, Frasetto had nine inactive subjects um, that he put on paleo, he or she, I, I don't know which, put on paleo for 10 days only. And all nine, all nine of them had improved blood pressure, better arterial function, better insulin, cholesterol, and triglycerides. Just 10 days. And then the same, same one, Lindelberg in 2009, uh, had 13 diabetic patients that he put on both the standard diabetes diet and the paleo diet for three months each, so it was a crossover study. The paleo diet resulted, resulted in improved weight loss, waist size, blood pressure, better HDL, which is the good lipid. You want that higher. Triglycerides, blood glucose, and hemoglobin A1C. And hemoglobin A1C, uh, for those of you who don't know, is just a measure of your, your uh, blood sugar level over time. So it's a better way, better than just measuring your glucose at, at one moment. It shows kind of where your glucose has been for the past weeks or months. Okay, paleo foods. Now we get down to what, what do I eat? When's she going to tell me what I can eat? So basically you're going to eat like a hunter-gatherer, like a caveman. So vegetables, 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 and a few more vegetables. Of course, vegetables today are different than the vegetables of the Paleolithic times, very different. So we're not doing truly a Paleolithic diet. What we're doing is we're approaching it. We're doing the best that we can with what foods we have access to today. So uh, vegetables, a, a wide variety is always best. And then roots, things like yams and carrots and beets and turnips. 
nuts and seeds, almonds, Brazil nuts, walnuts, all sorts of nuts and seeds, really good with the omega-3 fatty acids. And then meats, again, the key is lots of variety, and eggs are in there as well. And then fruits that are uh, especially low glycemic fruits if you have any health issues or metabolic issues. Um, you want to stick to the, the lower um, sugar fruits, but in moderation. So grains and legumes were not consumed um, in very much of a quantity at all back in the old times. And they didn't, you know, they may have eaten a few grasses and grains, but it didn't represent a significant portion of their diet. It was really about meats and fish and other animal proteins and then wild foraging for, for vegetables and things. Foods to avoid. Now, this is going to be uh, let's see. okay. I'm sorry, I was distracted by a, a question that came in. If you could just hold that question, then we're going to have question and answer here momentarily at the end. Okay. Um, so grains would be avoided, especially glutinous grains. But corn, wheat, barley, oats, rye, quinoa, all of those are not part of the paleo diet. Even whole grains and sprouted grains, because they tend to uh, have insulin effects. And we'll be talking more about that next time. Legumes are to be avoided, and those are all kinds of beans and peas, lentils, peanuts. Peanuts are actually a, a legume. And, of course, soybeans are as well, and, and those would be avoided. Dairy for the paleo purist would be avoided, but the reason this talk is called Paleo Plus is because I don't think that all dairy needs to be avoided. I'll be talking more about that next time as well. Refined sugars, yes, avoid these. Refined vegetable oils, you can just cross those right off of your, uh, rip them right out of your pantry. Fatty meats. Um, that was something that came from Cordain's work. He recommended avoiding fatty meats, but I would argue that if you're eating the right kind of meats, those that are raised on grass pastures, not in factory farms, they're already going to be leaner. And uh, so I don't think you really have to worry about the fat content and, and meat if you're eating the right ones. Salt is another thing uh, that Cordain recommended against. Uh, I'm going to be talking about that next week as well because salt can be good salt and salt can be junk food salt. So it really depends on what kind of salt you're talking about. Interestingly, human beings evolve no biological requirement for carbohydrates. We love them, but we don't actually need them, like we need proteins and fats. I saved the best for last. Okay, so that's a good point to pause for questions. Let's see. So bear with me while I... <laughs> bring up my chat window and, and those things. Okay, so I'm going to... Uh, Yolanda, I'm, I don't have, again, I don't have a an unmute button for you. So if you could maybe type your question in the chat window. Um, but I have no way to unmute you. And while you're doing that, let me look and see what the questions are here. So Karen asks, I'd like to know about detox and the best way to do that. How long and what to eat or drink for seniors particularly? Um, to do so every oops, to do every so often while transitioning. Also, if you eat sugar after not for a while to detox, stop having desire to eat sugar. Okay, so I guess what I would say is um, if you clean up your diet and you pretty much eliminate extra sugar and processed food, you're going to be detoxing all the time and gradually. And so detox is something that your body is going to do every day. 
and the uh, the more the more stress you put on your your liver every day, the less energy it's going to have to detox. You know, and your body detoxes, especially while you sleep, because it doesn't have to do other things. Um, one of the really good ways to detox is to do intermittent fasting a couple times, two three two three days a week. So make sure there's like 12 to 16 hours between dinner and your first meal of the day, and that can be give you a little bump in terms of detox. And then you can also do an actual detox plan. But a lot of people don't really need to because once you get rid of the foods that are causing the problems, your body's just going to do that naturally. Okay, Christine asks, my opinion of coconut oil, it's awesome. Absolutely wonderful. One of the best fats you can eat. Um, yeah, just make sure it's organic and minimally processed. Some of the best oils and fats, coconut oil, avocados are absolutely fantastic. Uh, raw nuts and seeds. Um, I would say I would prefer the nuts and seeds versus the oils that are made from them because they're less likely to be oxidized. Everything, kind of a general rule, is things should be consumed the closest to their natural form that you can get them as often as possible. So the whole food versus the extract. So even, you know, eating, of a, eating a coconut, pieces of coconut, you know, you're going to get the coconut oil, but it's also going to have all the other benefits of the things that are synergistically good for you that are part of the whole food. And Lisa asks, what about the Mediterranean diet, which has a focus on plant foods with limited animal protein intake? Um, I think it's a good diet. I mean, I I think that there's a lot of good to be said about the Mediterranean diet, and it certainly overlaps with paleo. I guess the primary difference is in the grain. And if you are really healthy and uh, don't have a lot of health challenges, I think it's kind of like try both. Try each one for a month or two and see how you feel. Um, if you have insulin issues, then I think paleo is probably better uh, to get that stabilized. But no, I think, you know, so many people eat junk food and, and a lot of processed stuff that either Mediterranean or paleo is going to be a step in the right direction. Let's see. Christine asks, why not legumes? We'll be covering that next time. I'll be going into detail uh, about legumes and, and what some of the arguments are against them. So you have to come back. Stay tuned. Okay. Orange juice not some concentrate. Is that okay? Uh, in, it's really not recommended because it's, it's a pretty big bolus of uh, sugar. I'm a big proponent of juicing, but I think you can't in juicing fruits, you just get too much sugar all at once. So if you were going to want to juice an orange, I would say put the juice of an orange into an entire quart of green juice, and then you're going to be diluting it a little bit and not having that hit on your liver. Better to eat the whole orange. Okay, Yolanda asks, I understand you to say that sugar causes inflammation. Can sugar possibly affect the lymphatic system? Well, I think that it can because um, the more inflamed you are and the more stuff you have floating around in your in your blood, the more overloaded your lymph system is going to be. So yes, absolutely. Vic asks me, how would you best contrast the difference between a paleo diet and Atkins? It seems like they're pretty similar. Um, I think there's a lot of, there is some overlap there, but Atkins was, at least in the early stage of Atkins, uh, much lower in carbohydrate. Paleo is a low to moderate carbohydrate diet because you do get roots, you get some yams and, and winter squash and beets and carrots, things like that. And in Atkins, those are off off the list at least in the first stage, and it's been long enough since I've read about Atkins that I don't remember how much they let you have later. And plus, Atkins did not have a focus on whole foods or the type of fats. And uh, I think that that needs to be in 
this day and age when we have so much toxic food needs to be part of it. Um, Let's see, in which health circumstances should an individual not do paleo? Um, I don't know. It's hard for me. If, if, if you asked me for a, if you were thinking about a certain health, health circumstance, it would be easier to answer that question because I can't think of all the ones where you wouldn't. I would say anytime you start a new diet plan, it would be good to talk with your healthcare practitioner about it and find out if it's contraindicated um, now that you know a little bit about what paleo consists of. Um, you can specifically ask about it. I would say pay attention to your body, maybe employ different aspects of it um, gradually, and see how you feel. But I don't think it's really going to do harm to anybody unless you go real extreme and don't pay attention to how you're feeling. Let's see, can you tell us? Who the, yeah, I thought you might ask about who the holistic cardiologist is. Um, oh, my ex-husband saw him, Dr. Naden. It's um, Ruben Naden, which is spelled, I believe, R-U-B-E-N, his first name, and Naden, M-A-I-D-A-N. And he's up in Kirkland. And he's not 100% holistic. He's kind of like straddling the line. He's a traditional cardiologist, but he's very open to um, working with you, for example, um, he will lower the amount of statins that he'll prescribe, you know, to, so that you're not getting a massive dose like most people do. So he, he just, he's, um, I think he's very reasonable, he's very knowledgeable, and, and uh, there just are not very many cardiologists that will bend. So I'm thrilled to have found him. Okay. I think that's all the questions. I see a couple of hands up on my little list, but I don't have the unmute button next to them. So hopefully everybody who had their hand up typed me a question. Well, I guess I'll go ahead and close. And um, let's see here. Whoops. <laughs> I have all these little windows on my desktop. Hopefully you can't see them. So next week on Wednesday at 7, we'll be doing part two. That's Thursday, I mean, sorry, Wednesday, February 12th at 7. And we'll be taking a closer look at some of these specific foods, like the proteins and the fats and what carbohydrates are, are good and what ones may, you know, to avoid and the right kinds of fat and why fat is such an important nutrient for us and we're not getting enough of it and what, what effects that's causing on our health. We'll be looking at also dairy and the role of fermented foods because that's something that most paleo people don't talk about and I think it's extremely important that we get some fermented foods because of our gut flora and the whole immune system connection. Um, so basically that's it, and also I want to focus on how to do paleo by staying planet-friendly and sustainable and kind to yourself and not creating any more stress because if, if this is a stressful diet, then it's not going to have the benefit for you. So let's see, I think that is it. I really want to give a thanks to Harmony Hill for giving me the opportunity to do this and hope that you will all join join us next week for part two. And if you want to check out my book, it's on the screen right now. It's Is the Paleo Diet Right for You? And it's available on Amazon, uh, digital or in paperback. So thank you very much for joining us and uh, hope to see you next week. <laughs>